Let's move on to body composition. So for decades, everyone kind of used fat, the percentage of fat as an indicator of where they were with their health. And now it seems like the conversation is moving over to muscle mass. But we also know that fat plays a vital role in one's health. So how would you describe the relationship between fat, muscle and bone density and so forth. How do they all work together? Yeah, they're all interrelated. And you know, fat is not a bad word at all. And I don't want people to be scared of that, but I think there's a couple things we have to think about. First of all, I want to introduce a term called sarcopenic obesity. Sarcopenic obesity is a replacement of muscle with fat. So as you lose muscle, you gain fat to fill in the space and sarcopenic obesity is a loss of muscle and an acquisition of fat. As we age and we lose muscle, that muscle is replaced by subcutaneous fat. So I have a great slide also in one of these lectures which looks at the cross-sectional anatomy of three separate people. On the top, I have the cross-sectional leg of a 45-year-old triathlete with wonderful skeletal muscle mass. You can see his femur bone in the middle and just a little slight hint of subcutaneous fat around that muscle. Now, fat is pro-inflammatory, so the more fat you have, the more circulating inflammation, the higher the risk of disease. So he has very little fat, and as such, at a much lessened risk of chronic disease. Below that picture is the cross-sectional anatomy of a 74-year-old sedentary person. This person isn't moving much at all, sitting around, and they have just a very small amount of skeletal muscle around the femur bone and a very significant amount of subcutaneous fat. His leg is almost all fat with a little bit of muscle. And that is exactly the problems we see. So he's much more prone to many of the chronic diseases because of that fat, all of the problems we're talking about and we'll talk about going forward. And then finally below that, we have a 76-year-old triathlete and a cross-sectional anatomy of his leg. And his leg looks almost identical to the 45-year-old uh, above, meaning he's got great muscle, very little subcutaneous fat. He's been biking and doing all of his triathlon for years, and his leg looks almost indistinguishable. So that carries not only movement, but endocrinologic benefits, which is really important. So you're saying the MRI looks identical from the top, from the 40-year-old to the 65-year-old. Darn they, close. I mean, you can barely wow. tell them apart. And so <laughs> I want people to be able to see that and visualize that and recognize that their, you know, their health fate is largely in their hands. More than half of their fate is in their hands. I don't want them to think it's just unavoidable. Definitely getting older is unavoidable, but how you get older is something we can definitely affect, and I want everybody to think about that. So muscle is extremely important to maintain over the course of your life. I mentioned before the importance of building and maintaining skeletal muscle, that you lose skeletal muscle over time. That carries both movement and endocrinologic effects. And it's really important to build and maintain your muscle. You know, fat is also important. Fat is not the devil. We want to have fat. We need fat. Fat's an energy source. And there are a couple of different kinds of fat. There's what's so-called white fat and brown fat. So white fat is the kind of fat we get when we eat unhealthy foods. We all get more white fat as we age, sorry to say. <laughs> but how much fat we get makes a big difference. There are healthy zones of fat and there are unhealthy zones of fat. And uh, when we start thinking about fat, we want to think about how we get as little of white fat as we possibly can. Some fat is necessary. In fact, in, in women, particularly women under the age of 40, if they don't have enough fat, they can't generate a menstrual period, which can link to low bone density and low bone mass and cause problems later in life. So white fat is, a bit absolutely. of white fat is necessary. Yeah, white fat is absolutely necessary. We need it for you know, our body's insulation and we need it as an energy source. So brown fat laden with mitochondria is a readily available storage site for mitochondria. In fact, we do a lot of work at our hospital on training endurance athletes to utilize fat instead of glycogen as an energy source with people doing endurance events. And you can train your body with some specific information on how to burn fat as your energy source. A lot of that is related to brown fat. And the good news here is that if you follow some of the guidelines we're talking about, there is some evidence you may be able to turn some of your white fat into brown fat, which is, which is great for us. And then finally, bone. So bone changes with time. Bone gets weaker with time. So that's important to know things like osteoporosis. We think about osteoporosis as a grandmother's problem, very low bone density. We inc increasingly recognize that osteoporosis can be a problem as a teenager that then manifests itself later in life as you get older. Your peak bone mass, which is about 30 years old, if it's not high enough, 
then you tend to get osteoporosis earlier in life than somebody else. So all these things work together. They're all very much part of the aging process. We want to make sure you're doing the very best job of taking care of all these things in a preventative way. We live in an era of data. I mean, you can literally track anything. We have trackers, we have our phones and apps on the phones and anything from a ring to watches. I mean, pretty much everything. It's what would you say is actually relevant? What should we be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, this has definitely, Dina, been a phenomenon that we've seen grow in like the last 10 years. And I can remember back to where, you know, we didn't track much of anything. And now you're absolutely right. We track, people get all kinds of data from all kinds of sources. They come into my office saying, my, this is, my cadence is this, my respiratory rate is this, my sleep value is this, my sleep score is this. What does it all mean? And the answer is that a lot of it is just numbers at this point. I think the big picture you need to think about is what's going to motivate you to make lifestyle changes? That's a great use of some of this data, but definitely we are living in the TMI era. Too much information. Now, where do we, where do we kind of see this? Well, I think in the past when you went to the doctor, you got your vital signs, and vital meaning life, the vital signs, you kind of respiration, blood pressure, heart rate, those things track to health. So. Uh, things like high blood pressure correlate to disease. So if you have high blood pressure, you definitely want to know about it. We also have heard a lot about the BMI, body mass index, which is increasingly losing favor because it is not very specific to different body types. Now, BMI is essentially your height and your weight, but if you're, if you're overweight, you'll have a high BMI, but if you're normal body type and very muscly, you'll also have a high BMI. It doesn't distinguish between the two. So BMI is a good value, but it's not terribly predictive in terms of what kind of body you have. I have a very high BMI. Yeah, great. <laughs> according to, according to the doctor, I am obese, yeah. or according to BMI. <laughs> yeah, so you're very healthy. That's a perfect example. So you're very healthy, you have terrific muscle mass, and yet your BMI, BMI is high. So we don't use that as much. I mean, it's a good, somewhat of an important value people like to track, but it's not very specific to different people for that reason. Now, as we've gotten more information, we're getting different kinds of information. So things such as resting heart rate, your resting heart rate value, and that is really important. We know that if your heart rate is lower, you tend to be healthier. There was a study done in Scandinavia looking at people's resting heart rate value, and if that value was high, then they, that correlated to all kinds of medical problems, heart disease, hypertension, et cetera. So it's a good screening tool to think about. The other thing we're hearing more about is heart rate variability, and that is the time between your heartbeats. And we've for a long time looked at that in tests like electrocardiograms, EKGs, but this concept as a value people are getting, it's showing up on people's smartwatches now in the last five or six years, heart rate variability, and this is an important tool to think about the function of your autonomic nervous system, meaning if your autonomic nervous system, your fight or flight mechanism, you're in a dangerous situation and you want to flee, your heart rate variability tends to change, and so if you're naturally in a high stress situation, you're not sleeping, your serum cortisol level is too high, you will have less interbeat dependence, meaning your heart rate variability will be about the same beat to beat versus if you're kind of doing well with your, your general health, your heart rate variability will be higher. So we're looking for higher values there. Again, one of the terms we're going to hear more about. The other one we've heard a ton about is VO2 max. And you may, in your training world, heard a lot about VO2 max. The idea of that is how much oxygen you can extract out of your blood, which correlates to how much ATP, how much energy you can generate. And that's dependent upon a lot of factors, how big and strong your heart is, how old you are. As we get older, our heart rate, uh, our peak heart rate diminishes, meaning we pump out less blood, mm -hmm. meaning we have a lessened VO2 max with aging. Um, but VO2 max is largely genetic. So I know there's a lot of people saying, maximize your VO2 max, come here and we'll give you the best VO2 max possible. I'm sure you hear it. Uh, in your fitness world too? It's actually an indicator of fitness in the gym world. So there are so many gyms, especially, I, I guess I can't talk for all gyms, but in London, they give clients a VO2 max test so that they know where the clients are on their fitness journey and then they're assigned to a trainer. So that is the holy grail yeah. of, which is, so it's so, crazy to hear that it's yeah, mainly genetic. I think the grail's a little bit muddy here. I think that, uh, that you know, again, you can improve your VO2 max but 
much of this is genetic and mm -hmm. how capable you are. So I would love to run like a sub two hour marathon like uh, Kipchoge, but his VO2 max is off the charts high compared to every other person. So mm -hmm. again, a lot of this is genetic and then what you do with that, you can train somewhat. The term we don't hear enough about is called lactate threshold. The level which the buildup of lactate in your blood uh, affects the general ability of your muscles to contract and how able you are to do exercise over time. And that is very trainable. So lactate threshold is a trainable value that affects your body's ability to tolerate exercise. And in the previous years, we've used just testing someone's blood, a finger stick test that we still do at the hospital, the most sensitive and specific way to get your lactate threshold. And so if you're doing one of our metabolic tests at our hospital, you're getting serial blood sticks to test your blood and test what happens to your lactate levels as you ramp up your exertion. But increasingly, there's technologies that can test lactate uh, without actually taking blood. I think it's an interesting new thing. I think much of that is on the way, but I think it will, much like VO2 max, now people can get off their watch. I think we're gonna hear more about this lactate threshold. Well, that's really interesting because some of our new techno gym equipment, such as the bikes and the treadmills, you can actually test your lactate threshold. <laughs> so we, we are, we're well underway there. Yeah, I think it's gonna be awesome. And I think people will really use that as a way to kind of evaluate where they are. And I think that'll be a great help for people going forward because that's a value you can really see change. And what about blood work? Is that another staple in traditional medicine? Yeah, so I think we're seeing a lot more with blood work, genetic testing, genetic screening, uh, all types of people's different uh, exercise tolerance, their genetic predisposition to certain types of exercise. Uh, again, this, this is a deeper dive for people that want as much information as they possibly can get. Um, there's a lot in there, and I think there'll be a lot in there going forward, but we've long used blood as a marker of how you are taking care of a disease. For example, if you're a diabetic, we get a test called the hemoglobin A1C level, which looks at your control of your diabetes over the past three months. And so some of this is now transitioning into this kind of longevity space, and I think there's many tests that will be applicable going forward um, in the blood test realm. So I think the, I would envision in the future that the longevity workup might include blood testing and genetic predisposition for people who want to know. Again, for some people it's TMI, for some people I wanna know what types of things I should be looking out for. There's not a right answer, it's just nice to know, for people to know that it's available. There's so many tests out there and so many trackers and we do have a one-stop fits all for this, the wellness passport in the Technogym ecosystem. So you can actually track your data all in one spot. You can track your sleep, your recovery, uh, your strength and cardio levels, your overall fitness levels, and you have it all in one spot, which is pretty cool because I think a lot of us, we, we test a lot of these different things and they're all in different places and we don't know how to put it all together. My hope for the future is that much of this kind of wellness information, exercise information, for example, now you come in, we get your vital signs, but I'd love to know how much exercise were you doing over the past months? How much intense exercise were you doing over the past month? How much strength training? How much have you been sleeping? I mean, for some people, they may not want me to know that, but I would love to know that on my patients because it would help me take better care of them. So I, I think in the future, we'll see more of a marriage between the, the data we get on our smart technologies and the medical chart. That's my hope is that those things will increasingly merge closer together.